In this video, you will learn about asymmetric key cryptography, also known as public key cryptography. The simple part of asymmetric key cryptography is that the algorithms generate two keys, a private one and a public one, and obviously one keeps the private one private and shares the public one. The key lengths are typically hundreds of bits for keys made from elliptic curves and thousands of bits for those made from the RSA algorithm. An important constraint is that the message being encrypted must be smaller than the encryption key. Therefore, in practice, asymmetric key cryptography is used to encrypt symmetric keys and hashes. Let's take an example. If Alice wants to send a long encrypted message to Bob, then she will have to generate a symmetric key and send that key to Bob first. So let's say that her message is that symmetric key. Then, using the RSA algorithm, she will multiply the message times itself e times modulo n, where e is Bob's public key. The result is the ciphertext, and that can be sent across an untrusted network. At the other side, Bob decrypts the message by multiplying the ciphertext times itself d times modulo n, where d is Bob's private key. The result is the original message, which is the symmetric key that Alice can use to send a number of encrypted messages to Bob. The math here is pretty fascinating. Take some message m, raise it to the power e, then raise that number to the power d, and you get back the original message m. And the inverse of that is true too. That is, you can first raise the message, such as a hash, to the power d, and then to the power e, and return the original message, such as the original hash value. And that latter method is the way digital signatures work. Encrypt the hash with your private key and let the receiver decrypt it with your public key. However, there are still a couple of concerns. First, how does Alice prove that Bob's key actually belongs to Bob? And the answer to that question is public key infrastructure, which we will address in a later video. The other concern is if the whole encrypted conversation between Alice and Bob is recorded and if Bob's private key is compromised by some attacker at some later point in time, then the attacker can decrypt the entire message. The solution to this is perfect forward secrecy, which we will look at right now. The goal of perfect forward secrecy is that the compromise of some entity's long-term key does not compromise past keys. The best way to visualize this is by using an analogy to the Diffie-Hellman ephemeral algorithm, but with buckets of paint instead of numbers. This analogy comes directly out of Wikipedia as referenced here. Once again, Alice wants to send a message to Bob. So, they both start out with buckets of paint of the same color. Then, they each separately choose a secret color. They each independently mix their secret color with the common color. Then, exchange blends over the untrusted network. Note that an observer can see the light brown and light blue blends, but there is no efficient algorithm for the observer to deduce the exact secret colors. The final step is for each to mix in their secret color to the other's blended color, with the result that both end up with the same common color. Okay, hopefully that explained the concept. Now, let's try it again with real numbers, but numbers way smaller than would be used in practice. And it's very important that you do not confuse the RSA math of the previous slide with the math of this slide. So here we go. Instead of deciding on a common paint color, Alice and Bob decide on a common number referred to as G and having a value of five in our example. In a minute, you will see that Alice and Bob will raise five to the power of their secret key. Alice and Bob also choose a common modulus, 23. All math will be done modulo 23, where the modulus is the remainder after dividing a number by 23. Then, they each choose a secret key, where Alice chooses A equals 6 and Bob chooses B equals 15. Now, they do the first set of math. Alice creates capital A by raising 5 to the 6th power to get 15,625 and takes the modulus, 23, of that number to get 8, where 23 goes into 15,625 679 times 
with a remainder of 8. Similarly, Bob generates capital B by raising 5 to the 15th power, which is 30,517,578,125, and then takes the modulus 23 of that number to get 19. Then they exchange the blended numbers. Finally, each raises the blended number to the value of their secret number, ending up with a common number 2. This is the concept of how to jointly arrive at a common number without one party sending an encrypted number to the other party as we did in the previous page. Therefore, this technique provides perfect forward secrecy, because even if the long-term private keys are compromised, the value arrived at using this method is derived from a combination of random numbers generated by two different parties, created on the fly, and discarded after being used for this session. In this video, you've learned how to encrypt a symmetric key with the receiver's public key, and how to create signatures by encrypting hashes with the sender's private key. You've seen the math behind the RSA algorithm, where a small message raised to the power of one asymmetric key becomes the encrypted value, and then that number raised to the power of the other key reveals the message again. RSA algorithms are used for encrypting and decrypting symmetric keys and hashes. And finally, you've seen how the Diffie-Hellman algorithm can be used to create perfect forward secrecy in that the common secret is generated on the fly without the final value being sent over an untrusted network. In a latter video, we'll see how the result is then used as a pre-master key for driving other keys. There you have it, asymmetric key cryptography.